I'm going to walk you through some of the some of the parts or actually all of the parts for the for the violin that I'm about to attempt to build and uh, try to explain some of the challenges some of the intricacies um, and hopefully some of the uh, the satisfaction of building a, a violin by yourself so um, here we are in my little workshop that I've set up I've, uh, I've accumulated some of the tools that uh, that are required for luthiery and uh, I am sort of uh, I'm sort of adding the tools to the to the set as I move along uh, so I don't over buy for one thing these, uh, these tools are pretty expensive for the most part um, and I'm not sure exactly how much uh, violin building and luthiery I'm going to do but uh, but um, anyways I've got all of the parts laid out here and I'll, I'll go through and I'll explain uh, how they all how they all fit together so the first thing we have obviously is the the main body of the violin and this kit uh, this particular kit comes with the body assembled now some uh, more experienced uh, uh, sophisticated violin makers uh, would probably would probably want this top at least removed uh, they would like to put that together themselves one of the reasons for that is that they would they would have preferences as far as the thicknesses of the wood uh, went for different parts of the violin and so they would probably they would probably customize it in that respect sometimes uh, a builder wants um, might want a, a kind of a deep alto you know a fat alto sound to a violin uh, some might want a, a higher, uh, a louder projection, more of a concert type of violin. And uh, that, that's all uh, personal preference, or if you were putting it together for a, for a customer, obviously they would, uh, they would be telling the builder what they wanted. So in this particular case, um, like I said, this one comes uh, with the body assembled, and that's fine. Uh, there's really nothing, the only thing inside a violin would be uh, on the the base side they have what they call a base bar inside and that's just a strip of of spruce that's glued inside here and it it helps to uh, to deepen the sound for the the two lower strings the two uh, base base side of the strings so other than that um, when we get down towards one of the one of the final steps of uh, once we get the uh, violin all uh, assembled and uh, varnished and finished the last thing we'll do is we'll put in a sound post and that that goes inside it usually goes it usually goes uh, kind of uh, behind and uh, slightly in side the uh, the uh, behind the bridge and so a, a luthier can affect the sound of the violin he can he can manipulate it by by moving that sound post around moving it back moving it towards the center and that sort of thing so I've only done that once and it's a pretty tricky little maneuver I have I have the uh, the specific tools for doing it um, uh, even at that it's it's a bit of a challenge kind of looking forward to that so that's the the main body of it so one of the uh, the first tasks on this is to uh, is to install what we call the purfling now some violins um, don't actually have inlaid purfling they'll have uh, they'll have a design painted on around the side here and that would obviously be the, uh, the easier the cheaper way of doing it but there are two uh, besides the uh, the aesthetics of it and the and the uh, appeal of having inlaid purfling one of the one of the benefits, uh, one of the uses for it, is to strengthen the wood of the violin. So, like I mentioned in my intro, uh, the wood because it's fairly thin uh, is prone to to cracking, um, mainly because of changes in humidity. Obviously, you can drop it and crack it, but as uh, as humidity um, increases or decreases. This uh, this purfling will help to strengthen the overall uh, the overall strength of the of the violin. Now, 
uh, while we're while we're speaking about uh, about cracking, what we use in violin making is something they call hide glue, and it's an animal uh, based glue made from made from uh, animal hide, as it says. Now it's a very strong glue, but it's it's also very uh, very brittle, if that makes sense at all. It it its holding power is very great, but uh, it's kind of that one of the reasons they use it uh, first of all you can actually take the violin apart easily if you have to uh, it, it will uh, it will break if you if you uh, hit it uh, like I said it's brittle um, but also it's used so that chances are the, the glue will let go before the wood breaks so so that's one of the one of the reasons they use a hide glue so once we get the uh, the purfling, I get all these channels. This, this, uh, on this particular um, uh, kit, everything I'm sure is is machine made. Uh, the the purfling channel is routered. Um, you know, probably everything is cut out by machine. Uh, when when uh, when a, a luthier is actually hand making a violin, one of the things that that uh, luthiers, I understand take great pride in is uh, is cutting the what we call the F hole. The F hole is uh, is for sound uh, projection and uh, for access to put in the sound post. It's decorative obviously but on this on this particular violin I'm quite sure that this these F holes would have been cut by a machine. Now uh, a craftsman, uh, a violin maker uh, that makes them from scratch, he will cut that F hole by hand and uh, they take great pride in that 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 F hole is their their signature their mark of uh, craftsmanship so uh, so anyways once we get the purfling all laid in and glued in place uh, that's going to be an interesting little challenge um, the the channels here are probably machine routed so I have to go through with a very very small screwdriver and uh, and knife and make sure all the burrs and, and everything are, are cleaned out of there. Got the purfling in place and so now the, the greatest challenge and one of the most critical parts of uh, a building or assembling a violin is the is uh, putting the the neck in place and fitting the neck. So on a violin there are very very specific here I'll show you on a different violin there are very specific measurements uh, for instance between the, the what we call the nut and the body is exactly 130 millimeters 13 centimeters um, the height here from the body to the neck is exactly four millimeters and if you laid a line along the fingerboard to the bridge um, where it intersects, where the bridge is, that's exactly 27 millimeters. So on a 4-4 a four, four size violin, which is a, an adult size violin, those, those measurements are, are uh, absolutely uh, non-negotiable. That's, that's, uh, that's what they have to be. So, so when I fit the neck on this violin, uh, I have to I have to mortise I have to cut a mortise in here and then I have to uh, trim the neck to to fit this mortise and it has to fit snugly and it has to fit so that so that all those measurements are true when I put the fingerboard on here um, all those measurements have to be true there has to be 13 centimeters here four millimeters here and uh, 27 millimeters here so that's a bit tricky um, this mortise and, and the neck they have to fit snugly because uh, because the the glue will be the strongest if the wood is uh, has a, a good snug fit but it can't be too tight because if it's too tight then whenever you have uh, changes in humidity uh, it could actually split the wood so I'm I'm looking forward to that with a bit of trepidation uh, it could be a it could be quite a challenge so a lot of this work is uh, like I said very tedious 
very precise, but um, these uh, these uh, pieces here, like the scroll on the neck, are all are all uh, machine cut and a bit rough. So so I'll have to get in here with uh, with uh, scrapers and files and sandpaper, whatever, and, and get it all smooth. And then once uh, once I've got the the neck glued on, then we start in with the uh, then we've got it all sanded and prepared. Then we start in with the varnishing process. And from what I understand, uh, with varnishing, the first coat uh, is is done with a sort of a swab, and and you actually rub the rub the varnish into the wood, and without it leaving any excess. That's to get the wood impregnated with uh, with varnish. So then. Uh, so then once the, uh, you, you've got that first coat on, then you can either add, you can add uh, color, you can dye it. I think I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards uh, making this one, uh, uh, not using any dye in the varnish and having it come out sort of a blonde color because uh, my other violins are, uh, they're uh, brown, red. My uh, electric violin is white. I don't have a blonde violin, so that's kind of what I'm going to shoot for with this one. So then, I think it uh, it could take up to about uh, six coats if I read the if I remember what the instructions said. So up to six coats of varnish, very thin, very evenly applied. And when it's all done, the top, uh, the spruce top, will have a uh, a nice fine grain running the length of the violin. The maple side ribs will have a, a nice flame to them, and. Uh, so that, that's a pretty standard thing. You've got maple maple on the back and the sides, and uh, spruce on the top. And uh, like I said, up to six coats. The the back will be uh, nicely flamed. They call it. You know the the maple um, ribs. Uh, the maple pattern will be look like it's flamed. And this is a this is a two piece. So the the back is made with two pieces of maple. And the top is actually made with two pieces of spruce, so that's a that's a pretty standard kind of a thing. the uh, The fingerboard is ebony, the nut is ebony, and the saddle, the saddle which is in here, that's the thing that the uh, that the tailpiece tailpiece hooks onto. Is uh, or, uh, it actually protects the back of the violin from this uh, the saddle string. Um, that's made of ebony. The finger, the uh, tuning pegs, the saddle, or sorry, the tailpiece, and the chin rest, and the end pin. The end pin goes in here. They're all uh, rosewood, and they're, they're kind of nice looking things. Uh, that rosewood's a nice pattern. So then, one of the last things you would do is uh, is fit the bridge. So the bridge again. To get optimum sound, uh, must be very precisely fit. Uh, you have to have as close to 100% contact between the bridge and the body of the violin, as close as you can get to 100% contact. So, I've only done this once before, but I, I uh, you actually do a lot of really, really fine work with a what, what amounts to an exacto knife and uh, trimming and shaping to get the feet to. Uh, to fit the body of the violin exactly. Then you're going to uh, trim the top down so that the, the so that the strings you'll get the right uh, the right amount of, of uh, uh, finger action fingerboard action on the strings. And those are all uh, fitting things we call them. You're fitting a violin. A lot of those things will be personal preferences uh, as far as the violinist goes. I, I'm fairly new to violining and uh, not very, not very uh, knowledgeable or sophisticated at it yet. So fitting for me, um, I'm not a very discerning uh, violin player. So, anyways, that's the that's the uh, challenge and the fun that's ahead of me, and uh, I hope everybody uh, enjoys this. I'm going to be. First of all, I'll start in uh, tackling this uh, purfling and gluing it in place. And when all is said and done, when I have that done, I have uh, everything put together, maybe I'll uh, grace everybody with a...